Everything I had hoped for my entire adult life just happened in the last three months, and I have no idea what to do next. I guess I'll just like order pizzas and play video games and drink. Everybody likes to complain about having to work for a paycheck. It gives you something to do and look forward to. If suddenly a lottery win shows up, it's no longer meaningful. You pop a couple champagne bottles, like you just kind of sit around being like, okay, now what? I used to have a lot of self-destructive tendencies. Like I was always that guy who was like, ah, your morning routine, like who gives a sh drinking, staying up to 3 a.m. I took like a lot of pride in being that guy. Self-destructiveness can feed creativity, but it's not sustainable. You gotta get your sh together. Mark, thanks so much for doing this. It's great to be here, man. Yeah, never met you. It's uh, thanks always, for having me. Always nice when somebody who's successful isn't a total jerk. <laughs> well, we just met, so <laughs> yeah. We, Mark and I just met for lunch, and uh, he immediately put me at ease. He's very nice. You've done a lot of interviews about your books. You said you don't really want to talk about your books. It's kind of boring. You've done that a million times. So I want to talk about the business of being a writer and books. And I want to ask you: Can you actually make money writing books? Yes. We'll define money. Like <laughs> you can make, you can make a dollar, you can make a thousand dollars. I mean, it, it's, you, you're probably not going to make like Tom Cruise money or Bill Gates money. Right. But you can, you can make a good living as an author for sure. So you're probably one of the most successful authors in the world, probably top 25 or something. Is that? Sure. Nonfiction for sure. Yeah. yeah. And can you make like single digit millions, double digit millions? So there's probably, you're probably at the top of the totem pole, you probably got like JK Rowling or something, you know, which is hundreds of millions. Maybe James Patterson is up there. Stephen King is probably up there. There's probably 50 to a hundred people who are in like the eight figure territory. And then maybe a hundred people who are a few hundred people in the, the seven figure territory. So it's not, you don't get this. I mean, I, it'd be interesting to see how it like, matches up compared to like say film or television or whatever music but it, it's probably analogous would you say it's similar to like becoming a professional athlete and making money at it like it's the 0.05 percent that does it when people say to you i want to become an author what do you tell them why all right first i ask why right because there's there's good reasons to do it and bad it's the same reason why if somebody says like i want to be you know, an NBA player or a basketball player, you know, the, the question is like, okay, well, why, what's motivating this? Well, actually that analogy probably doesn't work because there are a lot of reasons to become an author that have nothing to do with money, right? You can become an author to promote a business. You can become an author to promote a cause. Um, you can become an author to build a brand, develop, you know, share ideas, share research ideas. So there are a lot of people who write books who actually don't care about the money. It's the, the book is, it's more of like a marketing vehicle or a brand vehicle. How much did you make in royalties in your best year? I mean, it's hard to know exactly. I mean, look, Subtle Art has sold about almost 20 million copies. And pre-tax, you know, I probably get 2 to $3 per copy pre-tax. So you can do the math. It's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good life. And would you say that you're more an author or a business person? This is a funny question because I'm more known as an author. I'm most successful as an author. I think I see myself primarily as a business person and I enjoy the business side more than I do. I think I'm a better writer than I am a business person, but I think I enjoy business more than I do writing, which is a strange place to be. And did you become a business person because of the opportunity? No, I became a business person because I just wanted to like party on beaches in Brazil and make money while I slept. Like, you know, the whole <laughs> the whole four hour work week promise. Um, that's why I got into it. Writing kind of happened as a side effect of trying to build like some e-commerce brands in the early 2010s. And when I started blogging, it it just turned out that I was really, really good at the blogging aspect and, and the marketing aspect. And I was terrible at the e-commerce aspect. So the writing really took off and took on a life of its own. And I never had aspirations as a kid to be an author. I never, I didn't do great in writing class. I, I didn't study writing in college. Like it just, I kind of stumbled into it. I always remember my first dollar I made online. I sold something on eBay that it was like lying around my parents' house and then I transported it into money and it was magic. What was your first online dollar? <laughs> I love this question. I sold a $19 ebook uh, on bartending mixology 
and through ClickBank. And they took like a 13% fee or something like absolutely ludicrous. But I remember like that first, like that first deposit, they had, they had like a $50 minimum, that first deposit of like, you know, $63 or something hitting my bank account when I was completely broke. And it, yeah, it felt like magic. So you went from a blogger selling $19 eBooks in say 2007 to in 2017 hitting big, subtle art of not giving a fuck blew up and you started making serious money um, what was that transition like for you? So that's a 10 year window, right? So the, the first nine years of that, that window, my income probably compounded at a 20, 25% rate. So I was pretty broke the first couple of years and then kind of had a middle-class income for a few years and then had like a low six figure income for a few years. And then suddenly everything like 10, 20 X from there, the, I think there's really something about our psychology, like the the slow compounding feels natural and normal. It feels very good. It feels like if you make 20% more than you made last year, like you feel really good about that and you don't feel like a different person. Like the world hasn't changed, your life hasn't really changed. It just feels like a slightly better version of your previous life. When suddenly that 10X hits, that like that curve goes exponential. I don't think our brains are really wired to handle that. So initially it just felt very unreal. It was just kind of like, I remember that first royalty check coming in and I just kind of stared at it like, what? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> are you serious? And then I think there's, there's a little bit of almost like seeking and finding like new identity stability, like really understanding what the implications are on your life, like understanding I don't have to live in this small apartment anymore. I can go get a big apartment and then all the repercussions that come with that, or I can take a much nicer vacation now and all the repercussions that come with that. But then also the repercussions that happen on your relationships, on your interests, the people you relate to, the people you don't relate to, it starts changing everything. And, and most of those changes are subtle and unexpected. What kind of stuff? So you mentioned getting a bigger apartment, for example, what are the repercussions of that? that that's a great kind of microcosm to look at this like you know when you don't have money it's very easy to fantasize like oh, i just wish i could have this like sick fucking penthouse or whatever right and so then you get money and you try to go get the penthouse and and you do and and suddenly you realize like okay now i have to fill this place with furniture and furniture is expensive and you don't want to buy like ikea shit because you, you spend all this money on a penthouse so now you got to buy like the nice designer shit well now you've got all sorts of you know, you've got to hire the right designers and then the designers have the connections in Italy and France. And then there's all these customs issues. And next thing you know, like everybody's like siphoning off money off the top. And very quickly you realize that you're just getting kind of screwed left, right and center. Like it, it that, that was one of the first realizations that happened a couple years in. It's just like, oh, I'm a target now. Like there's people who are going to like try to like skim a little bit off the top. I'm going to be the first customer that they try to try to come get. We were in my house. I've got this, uh, I got a dog and we're trying to build a dog fence. And so it's like a 20 foot metal fence, right? Should cost a small amount of money. And my assistant calls a fencing company and she says, uh, yeah, uh, it's a house. This is the fence and this is the neighborhood. And she gets this crazy astronomical quote. <laughs> and then she calls back the next day and she says, okay, this is the fence. This is how big it is. And she says a neighborhood with a lower income. Yeah. Totally different quote. Uh, so that's not surprising, right? Like I don't blame those people for that. I understand why they do that. But then what I didn't, it, what my wife and I didn't realize is that starts making you distrust people, right? So it's like now when that contractor shows up and offers you a quote, my initial reaction is like, this guy's full shit. He's, he's trying to screw me. And that I didn't like how that made me feel about people around me. It's actually one of the reasons why I left New York because New York kind of has this permanent professional class that their unique skill is knowing how to like siphon off a percentage point off every, every, uh, transaction off rich people. So, you know, it, it's, I didn't like how that made me feel around towards people that I wanted to do business with, that I wanted to work with. Then you run into repercussions like people attach a lot of moral value and judgment around money. And I think a lot of that's probably for a good reason, but a lot of that is kind of unconscious, it's like unconscious bias. And a lot of people have a lot of self-worth issues around money. Like it's a sensitive topic, right? And so 
if you have a friend, say you've, you've had a friend for a long time who also lives in a tiny, shitty New York apartment and he used to come and hang out with you in your tiny and shitty New York apartment. And then suddenly he shows up and there's this big ass multi-million dollar penthouse with all this fancy French furniture. Some people don't take that well. Like some people get really weird about it and maybe start making judgments about you or they think that you're making judgments about them. Some people get very insecure. It doesn't complicate every relationship, but it, it complicates some relationships depending on the, the person's disposition towards money and wealth. I had a very similar experience and I noticed people would say little, they'd leak little microaggressions where they'd say things like, um, thanks for making time for me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or wow, you got a lot of space. Just these little, little comments and it, it others you a little bit. So how did it affect your friendships, family relationships? A lot of it, I think it probably starts with you is like your personal view on money. I never attached very much self-worth to money. I've had friends who are like, dude, like, why don't you have a watch collection? I'm like, cause I don't give a shit about watches. And then I had other friends who are like, why aren't you giving more to charity? And I'm like, well, I, I, yeah, maybe I should, you know, like it's, and so there's, there's, it's all, it raises all these questions, judgments, assumptions, and sometimes conversations, although you usually it's passive aggressive that wasn't there before. And so it, it just complicates things in a way that you didn't expect and you didn't anticipate. It does present opportunities for the relationships to get better. Like there are people in my life that I've been able to help financially and it's gone very well. So this is another thing that happens is like, you, you know, when you don't have money, you dream about like, if I get super rich, I'm going to help all these people in my life and it's going to be amazing because I love them so much. And you know, we're all going to be so happy and it doesn't play out that way. Like some people don't, a, some people don't want the help they like take offense to it. B, some people, they take the help, but then they, they resent it and they resent that they have to take it. It's complicated. <laughs> so let's go back to 2017. So you got that massive wire transfer or sure. royalty check. And what do you feel in that moment? And then what, what happened over those next couple of years? You know, in the moment it was really cool. It was kind of a celebratory moment. I remember taking a picture of the bank balance and sending it to my dad. And that was fun. That was cool. But it, it lasts like a day, you know, two days. Right. And then it's kind of, you're all on your back into your life. I actually became pretty depressed during that period, which is like, I, I always, I, I talk about this in interviews. I always feel weird talking about it. Cause like who the fuck wants to hear like <laughs> about the guy who got rich. I mean, yeah. The, yeah. Play all the, the world's smallest violin for me again things that I didn't anticipate, right? When you have all these, when you're young and you have all these goals, it's very exciting. You're like, you're working hard towards those goals. You're making your life better. Suddenly when you like, reality exceeds all the things that you thought was possible, something very counterintuitive happens, which is that you don't know what to hope for next. It's like, oh, everything I, f like, I had hoped for my entire adult life just happened in the last three months. And I have no idea what to do next. I have no plans beyond this point. And I'm 32. So shit, I guess I'll just like order pizzas and play video games and drink, you know? And that's basically what I did for most of 2017. It's actually like one of the most unhealthy years of my life, which is very strange. It's like being a lottery winner or something. Totally. It, it, the lottery winner thing is like, it's very confusing on the surface, but like it gave me an understanding of like why it happens. Everybody likes to complain about you know, having to work for a paycheck, but it's, it's like, it gives you something to do and look forward to. And it gives you something like to, to work on and something meaningful in your life. And if suddenly a, you know, a lottery win shows up, it's no longer meaningful. There's no longer any reason to work on it or work on anything. And so, you know, after a couple champ, you pop a couple champagne bottles, like you, you just kind of sit around being like, okay, now what? I found it so depressing to go from when I was when I was 20, I remember buying a new Apple product, like an iMac or something, was yeah. like this incredible thing. I was so excited about it. And then, you know, I started buying like 20 of them for my company and it's not a big deal. And then a car, you know, I'd fantasize about a car for a year. And before I knew it, I would just, oh, I'll buy three cars. Why not?
And then it was a house. Oh, I just messaged my banker and now I have a new house. <laughs> and every single one, like you said, come, came along with all this miserable, all these miserable logistics. There's like an overhead, yeah. That I didn't want to deal with. And suddenly I had to have people to manage the houses and none of it brought me any joy. It was like, imagine the joy of winning the Olympics and winning gold versus ordering an Olympic gold medal on eBay and putting it on <laughs> yourself, right? Like there's no, there's no satisfaction, there's no journey. Yeah. So you get all this money, it's very hollow. Are you done with money? Do you have enough? It's funny because I've noticed this, I've had a number of friends who kind of hit financial escape velocity recently and I've seen them go through it a little bit as well. It's like when you when you hit your number, right? When you hit the number that you're like I'm good, I'm set for life. I, I don't have to work again if I don't want to. It raises this question of what what's worth doing, right? Because I think our entire lives, I mean unless you grew up in a bunch of money, which I didn't. Our entire lives, everything we do is mostly influenced by this is going to increase your earning power. You know, you go to this school, you get this degree, you get this certification because you're going to get a better job. You'll make more money. You'll have a better life. Once you hit that point where you're like, okay, I've got enough. I'm good. I'm set. I don't need any more. Then you're in this position of like, okay, the only reason to do something is either it's fun. It adds value to the world. And that's kind of it. When you've spent your entire life kind of programmed to just you know, do the rat race, it takes a while to like reprogram your brain to think in those terms of like, no, only do it if it's fun and it adds value to the world. Like that's the only, like if it doesn't do those two things, don't do it because you don't have to. There's no other reason to do anything. That mental transition is, it's surprisingly difficult. What are the new goals or targets or things that you work on? Is it literally just whatever I enjoy day to day? I took a hard look at what are the things in my career that I really enjoy, that I love? And what are the things that I don't love? And let's start by just eliminating all the things I don't love because what's the point, right? And so once I did that, then I, I really I, I really started to zero in on like, okay, what are the things that I, I truly love and enjoy? And then from there, I started asking myself, like, what are some long-term missions or projects that I can build out of this? And what I realized is that I love, I mean, writing is part of it. I do love writing, but really what I love is like, for lack of a better term, the media business, the cre the creating, whether it's a video, a book, a movie, or a tweet, it's like creating content, building a brand out of that content, and 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 just systematizing that in some way. I love that. It's just fun. It's like to me, it's just I'm in a sandbox, playing, building building little castles like a kid, right? And then it turns out that that you can do, you can build some like very real long-term projects out of that, you know, like building a, up a, a creator business or a media business or, or whatever, like you can do a lot of great things with that. And so that's what I'm focused on now. That's why I canceled a really big book deal. I canceled all my speaking engagements. That's why I started doing more video content. Cause I, I realized I'm like, you know, if I'm going to be in this space and build a, a business in this space, then I should get good at video. And that's a fun new challenge. And I enjoyed creative challenges. So I did a pretty significant pivot in my career. And it was a lot of it, the personal side was completely motivated by that. And you, so you went from an anonymous, highly successful author to now a very well-known face out in the world you know, on YouTube. How has that affected your life? Maybe I'm not famous enough, but I have found it doesn't bother me. Like, I really don't mind it, whether it's just the way I'm wired or if I'm somehow accustomed to it, like it just doesn't bother me as much. So you're building a machine, you know, you've got 15 employees. What's everyone doing? What are all the channels? Let's break it down. I'm really curious to understand how it works. Two main teams. One is the, I just kind of consider it like the content team. So it's the production team. Uh, so that's YouTube podcast. That's producers, editors. Um, and most of those people are local in LA. We have a studio in LA. That's where we shoot everything. That's seven people. So that's about half the business right now. The other half of the business is more kind of like the web business. So website, newsletter, social media, managing operations, managing marketing. So I had a website membership. I did Substack before it was cool. Um, <laughs> before before Substack made, made, made it obsolete for me to do it. So I had a, a website membership. It's got some courses, a bunch of paid articles behind it. It's a small subscription fee. 
you know, $9 a month or whatever to get access to the full site. That used to be the primary revenue. It's since dropped quite a bit. And then on the front end, we do a lot of brand deals and sponsorships for both YouTube and the podcast. So right now it's, it's kind of revenues like 50, 50 from both sides. It's about 50% is back end membership. 50% is front end brand deals. And then obviously book sales. So you, you're a manager, right? You've got 15 people. Do you like managing a business? Do you like dealing with people problems or do you crave the times where you can actually just sit and write and you know make videos and do all the fun stuff? You know, for most of my career, I really dreaded managing. It's actually ironic because I, I hated managing when I didn't have to do much of it. When I ha- only had like three people on my team, I was like, oh, I don't want to have to manage these people. Like just figure it out go do something, you know, once the team started to grow, I actually had to learn how to manage and learn how to organize a team and communicate effectively, give feedback effectively. And I found that like, once I learned how to do it and actually kind of took on the responsibility, I started enjoying it. I wouldn't say like, I love it. Like it's not, it's not my favorite part of my, my job, but I do enjoy having a team. I do enjoy working with them and building something together. So it's uh it's something that i've had to like learn to love in work what's your happy place honestly it's like working on a script or ideation or outlining that's where i'm most effective and it's where i feel most at home so if you let's say you come up with another big idea you said you you canceled a book deal would you write another book or would you actually just do a youtube video on it do you actually think that books are still relevant at this point i do think books are still relevant i so i i see all these I see books as just another platform. It's 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 another TikTok. It's just a v- super long form, long term TikTok, right? I mean, it's it's it, that's a cynical way to put it, but it's like it's just a, the the publishing world's feed moves very slowly, and the recommendation system is much slower. But um, it kind of functions in the same way. It's like if you read James Clear and you really liked it, then your friend who read James Clear is going to recommend Mark Manson and then you read Mark Manson, you really like it. So it's, but it just happens over the course of many months. And I think, you know, all these media platforms, they synergize and they, they can stream into each other and they all play different roles, right? So the online platforms I see, their role is primarily discovery. So it's, it's easier for somebody to discover me through like a viral Instagram reel than convincing them to buy a $20 book in an airport bookstore. Once they've discovered me through that reel and they follow me for a while, they learn that I have a book, then when they see my book in the airport bookstore, it's an insta buy, you know? So it's these things, they all synergize, they kind of work together like puzzle pieces. So to answer your question, if I have a big idea, first of all, I probably don't know how big the idea is until I've made a video or done a tweet thread or written a newsletter about it. If I do that and it just blows up and the audience is like rabid about it, then I might start considering like, okay, well maybe this is, maybe there's a chapter here or, or a full book here. I have this theory that basically awareness creates misery, right? So when you're writing books, you put a book out, book out into the world and then you get your royalty check and all the data, I would assume 30, 90, 120 days later, there's no like day to day up and down. When you're running social media, you can put out what you think is the best video or tweet or Instagram post, and it can bomb. Yep. You can get shit all over in the comments. Like, how have you insulated <laughs> your mental health to not become a miserable social media person? <laughs> well, it, first of all, it helps outsourcing a certain amount of it. Like, there's I put barriers between. Like, I don't wade into the comment section very often. That's where I use a team as a buffer. Right. So I have a social media manager. I have a YouTube producer. Like I don't, I'm not on the front lines. I get kind of debriefed from them on what's working, what's not. Part of that too is just desensitization. I've been doing this a long time and you just kind of learn to not let some haters ruin your day anymore. I'm coming to actually like appreciate the tight feedback loop on the social platforms because like you mentioned the book, right? You can spend two years writing a book. It takes six months for it to come out, even once it's finished. Like you just went through this process. It comes out, you promote it for a month. You're like doing this whole tour. You're doing all this media and stuff. You're going out everywhere. Okay, maybe it hits a list. Great. 
But like, it's gonna be two or three months before a substantial number of readers have actually finished the book and you actually find out if they're recommending it to other people or not. And so like you, you don't actually know if your book quote unquote worked or if it landed well until like three months after you start writing it or sorry, three years after you start writing it or a year after it comes out. And that's like a very long flaccid feedback loop and it's very hard. And then if people, if it doesn't take off or if the word of mouth doesn't kick in, it's very hard to know why it didn't like what part of which chapter did people not relate to? You don't have that data. You don't have that feedback, right? So there's pros and cons to every format in every medium and in every content length. And I think the advantage of the social platforms is you get that super tight, strong feedback loop. You know exactly what worked, what didn't, you know, you usually know exactly why it didn't work or it did work and you can learn from it very quickly and get better. And so that when you do take the big, you know, you play in the big leagues, which would be like making a book or making a, a film or something, you're armed with, all that feedback and knowledge of like, okay, this is strong content. This is going to land well with people. You mentioned a film. You made a film. How'd that go for you? Dealing with the studio and everything else kind of sucked. I came away like very unimpressed. Also with the realization, like the movie was fun. I like it. I mean, it's not like, it's not going to win any Oscars or anything, but it, it's a fun movie. And like anybody who's fans of my work will probably like it. But like I came away from it realizing that you know, it's a, it's a low budget documentary film. I realized I'm like, I could have probably paid for this myself and then released it myself. And I would have made more money and it would, would have been seen by more people. And that realization was actually a huge part of my inspiration to go into YouTube. It was that experience that was happening at the same time as like Mr. Beast blowing up. And those two things happening at the same time was, was eye-opening for me. Would you say that the product itself was compromised or just the marketing and delivery? I think the product itself was, they did the best job they could with the resources they were given, which is a whole nother thing. Like it, it's, it's, let's just say the resource allocation within that industry is like not very optimized. It's, there's just a lot of waste and, and bloat, but like the production itself, like the, I think the director was a great guy. The production company was a New Zealand production company. I thought they did a good job. Like it, it was fine. It went well. I think the movie turned out it's, it's a good movie. It's fun. It's like the overall strategy planning. Like you can kind of tell that it, it, they don't know what they're doing. Most of my audience is, you know, young tech savvy. Like I knew all my own audience demographics. So I kind of went to them with all my own audience demographics. I'm like the, the, like the most logical place for this to land is Netflix. And, and there'd be this like awkward silence, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, we're really excited about this new, we've got this, this TV app that like, we're going to, be promoting with Samsung. All the studios are trying to create their own distribution platforms, like their own streaming services. And so there's like a lot of jockeying. So it's like Universal doesn't want to sell it to Netflix because they have Peacock, but then they also don't want to put it on Peacock because it's, they, they, they want, you know, all my fans to like go over here instead. And so we're going to launch it on this platform in this country, but then we'll put it on our own platform over here. And it, it's just like, it reached the point where like people would come to me and they'd be like, where can I see your movie? And my answer was like, I don't know. Actually, I actually have no idea. Actually today I have no idea where you can see it. I think Amazon prime has it. So when I first made some money, I was down in LA and I met a bunch of people and I was all excited. I was like, oh, I'm gonna fund movies. That'll be that'll be a fun thing to do. Yeah. And I was like, I was the patsy at the poker table yeah. and there were all the lines coming for the fresh meat. And there was one guy I almost funded and I didn't. And then I uh, watched him go on and sell the film. And it was one of the, um, one of the best performing films for Apple or something like that. And I was like, oh my God, congratulations, dude. And he's like, I didn't make any money. Because he had actually sold 
all the the rights for the film to some distribution company and then the distribution company splits that risk with 10 other people and ultimately it's a little bit like if i started a company in silicon valley and you know you were my first investor and i just give you all the upside it's just the most bizarre system and then you know the unions and all the complexity of it it just seems crazy i've heard so many horror stories similar to that both on the production side on the director side on the writers like screenwriters get hosed super hard like the, I've met screenwriters who literally spent 10 years working on a TV show that never got aired. They got filmed, pilot approved, filmed, like whole season shot and just like never went to air. Like, can you even imagine like that? It's it's insane. So it's my my little bit of experience. I, I did also I did a couple TV deals, you know, nothing ever got made. But it's just like that exposure to that world. It actually made me way higher conviction on the creator economy. What the creator economy lacks is just the, the quality of content is not caught up yet. The audience is still young. It's under monetized. But all those things are in time. All those things are going to get solved, right? Like the content gets better every year. The monetization gets better every year. Creators are getting better at scaling businesses and scaling production every year. And so you've got free global distribution. You have 100% IP ownership. To me, it just seems inevitable that like, you know, YouTube is the next cable television. So you've built this money machine, this business, and the byproduct of that is money, which gets spat out the other side. Is there anything you've spent money on that is worth it? Buying a home that you really love and you feel really, really comfortable, I do think is worth it. It, it is, it's hard to get it right, but if you do get it right, I think it's totally worth it. Luxury travel is fucking awesome. Totally worth it. You know, so there are things that are, that, that are worth it. If I end up with hundreds of millions of dollars, like what am I going to do with it? I don't know. In my head, I've just kind of like, I'm still young enough that I'm like, I'm just in build mode. Like, let's just build stuff. Let's create, let's, let's have fun. And then. I don't know, in my 50s or 60s, I can start worrying about what to do with it, where it should go. I imagine some sort of philanthropic thing is where most of it will go, but I, I don't really have a sense of what that is, and I'm not not in a rush to figure that out. As that number's increased and as you've gotten wealthier and had different problems, have you found that the people you spend time around and your friends end up changing? Yes. So this is another unexpected thing that you don't think about is we tend, I think it's human nature. We tend to socialize with people who are kind of at the same level as us or that we perceive to be at the same level as us. When I started my businesses, I was completely broke. I was living with my girlfriend. I didn't have enough money to like buy a burger, much less like do anything else. And all my friends, all my college friends had like nine to five jobs and were making decent, you know, 70 K a year, 80 K a year, whatever it was. And it was funny, I could feel they didn't really want to hang out with me anymore because I was kind of this like deadbeat loser who had nothing going for himself. And it wasn't a moral judgment. It was it was just like, you can't relate to each other. Like I couldn't relate to those friends. They were all talking about their new bosses and their new jobs and, you know, waking up, putting on a suit, everything. Like I couldn't relate to any of that. They couldn't relate to what I was doing. So I think the same thing happens when you kind of hit a certain socioeconomic bracket, you want to find people that can relate to you, relate to your problems and who understand what you're going through and people who don't have money don't, don't relate and they don't understand. It's like, I'm sharing, we're having this conversation about friends and family and stuff. It's like, there are plenty of people in my life that if I tried to explain this to them, they would just look at me like, what the fuck are you talking about? (laughs) Boo fucking who, (laughs) right? So it's, it's just that element. It's just human nature, right? We, we, we relate to people who are similar to ourselves. I love hanging out with entrepreneurs. I love hanging out with, this kind of comes back to the, the writer entrepreneur thing, right? Like I'm friends with a lot of authors, but I, I found that I don't live and die for the book I'm writing the way a lot of authors do. I relate a lot more to entrepreneurs, business owners, executives. You mentioned at lunch that when you first made money, you started hanging out with people in finance. Yeah. What was that like? <laughs> So I lived here in New York. And again, when you have a bunch of money, you tend to look for other people with a bunch of money. And here in New York, it's people in finance. So I I ended up hanging out with a bunch of uh, Wall Street guys. I'll say this. They were nicer than you would expect. Like really friendly, smart, smart guys. They're very much caught up in the status games and the rat race. I was enough of an outsider that I could observe, you know, it was like 
these guys at this hedge fund just bought houses in the Bahamas. And so now these hedge fund guys want to buy houses in the Bahamas to show off to these guys. Or there was another situation where it was like one guy had this, had a wedding in, in Italy. And then like the next year, one of the best men had to have a bigger wedding in Italy in a nicer hotel. Like it was, it was stupid. It was really stupid. It was just a reminder to stay off the ladder. It was funny. I was in New York about four months ago with my girlfriend and we we're walking behind these guys in suits, finance guys. And one of them goes, yeah, he's making $10 million, which is serious money in Chicago. Right? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this is like, if that's like the bottom of the rung in New York, like it's just, it's a crazy How out world. of touch, man. It's like, crazy. Like, it, 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 that's the thing too, is like, you really do end up out of touch. Like, and it's the thing too, is like in New York, yeah, 10 mil is like nothing. I remember thinking, you know, when we bought our place here, one of the reasons we bought it, like we were kind of frustrated with New York and we're like, you know what? I will probably start loving it if we get a really nice place. Like we'll just buy our way out of the problems. There's no buying your way out of the problems here. Like it's the $10 million place here is just as shitty and fucked up as like the tiny studio. You just paid way more money for it. I feel it. like New York is the great equalizer because even if you're a billionaire, you're still going to take the subway because ultimately it's the fastest way. It to is get the around. fastest way. Yeah. I mean, it was ridiculous, dude. Like we had, so the guy, we didn't, we weren't, we didn't have the penthouse. The, there was a guy above us who was CEO of a big public company was right above us. So his place was like 25, 30 million. There was a massive leak in the roof of the building. So he got it the worst. His place flooded first and then our place flooded after it. And then, and then the people below us, they got, they got a little bit of it as well. And we went to the building, like the, the builders and they were like, oh, too bad. <laughs> it sucks to be you. Like nobody cared. Nobody did anything. Nobody fixed it. Like we had to pay to fix it ourselves. There was like no insurance would cover it. Like it, it was so ridiculous. And, and I, I remember getting like my wife got into this like dumb argument with one of our neighbors. It's the same stuff that we argued about in like our $700 a month studios full of cockroaches. Like it's the exact same experience. <laughs> it's just, you have like much nicer curtains. <laughs> you mentioned writing a little bit. I'm curious, what do you read? Who makes you like gasp when you're reading their work? Oh man. The big one, the one who actually made me want to write seriously was David Foster Wallace. Hunter S. Thompson is another one. Joan Didion, a lot of her old essays, uh, I just think are brilliant. On the fiction side, you know, I'm a huge Tolstoy fanboy. In terms of like writing characters, like piercing a character's psychology down to like the core of who they are as a human being. I feel like Tolstoy's, uh, his descriptiveness of why characters behave the way they do is just unmatched. Like just absolutely leaves me in awe. Obviously Hemingway. What would you recommend that the audience read? I love Old Man in the Sea, Hemingway's novella that he won the Nobel Prize for. It is so sparse and simple and like heartbreaking and there's something deeply metaphorical about it it's it's also interesting that it's like the last thing he he wrote before he died it's such a simple story about a fisherman but like i don't know it, you get to the end of it and it just it feels so tragic i think what's brilliant about his old novels is there is that swashbuckling macho aspect of it but he's he he's sensible enough to like, he kind of hides the sensitivity and the insecurity of his characters, like underneath it. Like he's able to write that really well. Whereas old man in the sea, it's just like, it's almost like a, a sad old man in the futility of life. Like it just, you just feel the weight of <laughs> how like none of this matters <laughs> and we're all going to die. Like you're none of it's going to be, none, none of it's going to matter in the long run. I don't know. There's just something like so heartbreaking about it. The other one that I, I was, that came to mind is completely opposite war and peace. What I thought was really profound about it is that like, I didn't realize that he, he kind of originated a really important historical theory in writing it. You know, there's the great man theory of history, and then there's the great forces theory of history. And the point of war and peace is to really push the great forces theory of history of that. Like it wasn't that Napoleon was so great. It was that, that there were just global circumstances bigger than all of us that like made him inevitable. And to show that convincingly, you have to write, this insanely wide breadth of characters and all and like 
a wide variety of situations in in different parts of the world and show how everything like interconnects and he slowly does that over hundreds and hundreds of pages so that when you do get to napoleon you're like oh well yeah of course this happened right so just the way he constructed that was like awe-inspiring like i i I remember finishing that book and being like i can't believe a single human brain produced this like that's just beyond if if you like that you'd like um all the light you cannot see i love that book amazing he does that exact same thing and the tension that builds and it just dovetails perfectly you have a pretty awesome life like when i met you i actually thought you'd be more of a misanthrope you actually (laughs) seem like you seem pretty like you seem pretty optimistic positive like you seem like you're in a good place where where what's what's your source of stress right now like when you're losing sleep at night like what causes it part of the reason i am in such a good place is that if i'm losing sleep it's probably over a problem that i chose and i'm happy to have and it's probably around some business issue i used to have a lot of self-destructive tendencies and i think the combination of you know the career success just getting older it's like forced me to come to terms with a lot of that stuff and i think i've gotten a handle on it you know i quit drinking a couple years ago i've quit everything i don't do any drugs anymore physical health has been another thing just like getting healthy getting in shape like it's been so profound for me that i feel like an idiot for ignoring it for decades like i was always that guy who was like ah fuck your morning routine like who gives a shit you know staying up to uh, drinking staying up to 3 a.m going home writing a blog post uh, I took like a lot of pride in being that guy, but yeah, now I, I recognize that like there's something to it. Self-destructiveness can feed creativity, but it, you can't, it's not sustainable over the long run. So if you want to like really build something with longevity, you got to get your shit together. One thing I like to always do, I always listen to like Tim Ferriss and stuff and he has all these amazing people on and I'm always like, tell me the books to read tell me the pro- products to use services yeah. whatever what are you, some of your favorite products and this could be as simple as a pen or a book or a little thing you do a reminders app whatever what what are you, what are a couple things you love shout out to garmin watches i've tried all the wearables and it's funny cuz garmin's like it's marketed towards runners which is that's why i bought it cuz i was going to train for a marathon and then i started using it and i was like this is better than like all the other wearables i've ever tried so What's good about it? Because like, isn't it? I always look at those and I'm like, okay, that's like the Apple Watch for guys that want to be a little more like I'm mm-hmm. a Navy SEAL or something. <laughs> well, it is. It is more durable. I mean, it's designed like you can take it in the ocean. I can go surfing in it. I can go surfing, then go run a marathon, and it like works for everything. It also it tracks all the same stuff that like a Whoop or an Aura Ring does. And as far as I can tell, it does it just as accurately, right? So it's it's all in the same thing. And like I find the Apple Watches to be a really inaccurate, and then b the battery life terrible this battery life it lasts like two three weeks basically never charge it it works for everything any exercise you want to do any environment any circumstance tracks everything you would ever want to know syncs with every piece of software that you could use it with so yeah i was surprised i i i went through all the big wearables and then i bought this to start running and I was like, oh, this is better than all of them. When you think about who you want to be like when you're older, is there anyone that comes to mind? Like, like, do you have a North Star of somebody you're modeling? I don't have anybody that I'm specifically trying to model just because I think the industry I'm in is is kind of, it's new territory. It's like the Wild West a little bit. I kind of have this working theory of like, it's going to become more important to be a generalist or it is becoming more important to be a generalist given just the breadth of information and technology that we're exposed to i feel like the ability to make broad connections between disparate spaces is gonna soon be much more valuable than being like excellent in any narrow space in particular so what are you excited about right now what kind of rabbit trails are you going down i used to live as a digital nomad i traveled a lot it's been interesting so the some of the youtube stuff that we've been doing it's been kind of these cultural investigations So like we did a video in Korea about the mental health crisis there and that, that was really fun. It went really well. Like I kind of got burnt out on traveling for a long time. It kind of felt like, okay, I've seen all the places I want to see and I don't really, I don't know. It's just like, there's nothing that I, on my bucket list, right. That I, I'm like dying to go see, but since kind of engaging in 
like doing this cultural investigation. Like we're about to do next week. I fly to Hungary because we're Hungary has the most alcoholics per capita in the world. So we're going to do a video about that. Like why is alcoholism so prevalent in Hungary? And we're going to visit a bunch of bars in Budapest and go see distilleries and talk to a bunch of local psychologists. That's like unlocked a really exciting fascination for me about the link between culture and history and, and psychology. You know, so much of my work is based around values and how values drive, you know, values, your values drive your priorities, your priorities drive your actions and your actions drive your outcomes. You know, that's a, that's essentially my work in a nutshell. So start with the values, figure out what you care about, what's important to you. What's really exciting is that through these YouTube videos, I've been able to, to merge like my passion for travel and interest in culture, because ultimately culture determines a large extent of our values, of what we care about and what's important to us. So how can we look at a specific culture, the values, the history, the incentives, the pressures within that culture, and then how, what are the connections we can make between that and like behavioral mental health outcomes of that culture? Like why do Hungarians drink so much? Why do South Koreans have the highest suicide rate? Like to me, that's just endlessly fascinating. And it's also a little bit of a blue ocean content wise. So it's, I'm super excited about it. That's awesome. Well, it's also, I find, um, when you travel, I call it tick travel, where you like go and you're like, oh, I saw this and I did this. And at the end of the day, you're like, why am I here to be in like a luxury hotel and I'm just jet lagged or whatever? I feel like adding purpose to travel is actually really powerful. It is, it's been hugely powerful. And it's, it's cool too, because, you know, previously when I traveled somewhere, it was kind of to get away from my day job. You know, as I was going on vacation, I like got to turn off the Mark Manson switch and like just blend, sit on a beach and blend in. This is fun because it's like I get to leverage. So like we're going to Portugal in a few weeks and every country I go to, I just email my publisher in that country and I'm like, hey, I'm coming to town. Get me on TV. Get me interviews with all the top psychologists. You know, get me access to this like famous historical site and they do it. So I'm like, I'm now I'm like, you know, leveraging my celebrity for like really cool and exciting productive things. Derek Sivers does that too. He just goes, um, I'm going to India. And then he looks at, I think he has like 200,000 email followers or something like that or subscribers. And he just emails a bunch of them and he says, Hey, can I hang out with you? Can we just spend a day together? And he just goes to India for like 14 days and he'll every day he'll spend with a different person. And instead of going and being like, Oh, I went to India. I saw the Taj Mahal. I ate a bunch of Indian food. He goes, Oh, I got to make 14 new friends that are all interesting. And I feel like, yeah, he's figured that out. He's cracked travel. Sivers is another one. He's a good friend of mine. And yeah, every time I hang out with him, I'm like, this guy, you've, this guy's got it figured out. I just feel my blood pressure go down whenever I talk to him because <laughs> he really does. He really does have it figured out. He's another guy. Like it, it's just a shockingly uncommon level of wisdom. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Right on. Well, dude, this was really fun. Yeah. And uh, it was great getting to know you a bit. And thanks for doing it. Yeah, dude. Thanks for having me.